Boy, let me tell you, we talk about got a healer, and I see Doug Brown here. In, ca in case you didn't know, quadruple bypass surgery, what, a little over a week ago? Wow. And he came in to see us at church, in the office. I was like, what are you doing here? Fortunately, his wife drove him, so he's list <clears throat> listening to the doctors. That's good. Great to see you. Well, let's pray together. Father, we do pray that, that the Spirit of God would fill us. You gave us that command, be filled with the Spirit, be under His control, His influence. We thank you that <clears throat> as we surrender to you, that you are the teacher, Holy Spirit, that you teach us, that you open our eyes, you open our hearts, that you bring conviction and a desire to change. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So as you know, we're going through the book of Ruth, and <clears throat> the book of Ruth took place during what time period, what group, what the judges, so about 1300 B.C. What was the characteristic of the period of the judges? What was it like? Yes, it was very corrupt. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. There were three people who stood out. There were probably many others. God always has his remnant. He always has his group. There were three, of course. We're reading about them. We're studying them from the book of Ruth. It's who? Who were the three people in the book of Ruth? Obviously, Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz. Today, we're going to look at noble character. Noble character. God is more interested in our character than our comfort. A number of years ago in our first church plant, it was in the mid-80s, I was really excited, you know, about starting this church. And the church that had sent us out, the pastor said to me, he goes, hey, you want to start a church? I said, sure. I didn't realize what I was getting myself into. We did a Bible study for three months, asked the people who was interested in helping us. We had a grand whopping toll of one couple. Yeah, we'll help you. That first service, we had like 17 people meeting in a Grange Hall. It was bare bones. After about three years, it was growing. New people were being added. And then a wolf came in, <laughs> stole half the congregation. I said, I'm quitting. My wife said, no, we're not. <laughs> and we didn't. God began to rebuild that group and the lead pastor of the Sending Church said, come and speak to our leadership team and tell them your prayer request, how you could use some help. And I thought, okay. So I did. And I get a call from one of the, this is, this is a large church now. It's a Baptist church. And it was a large church, our Sending Church. I get a call from one of their leaders, somebody I looked up to, and he calls me and goes, hey, we want to, we feel God is calling us to help you with your church, church plant. I'm going, Bob Brown? This guy? I was intimidated. I'd only been in ministry three years. I'm going, he's going to help us? Amazing servant of God, he and his wife. Great coach, great mentor to me. Many times I would come to him with crazy ideas. <laughs> and he said, well, uh, that could work, but let's pray about it. <laughs> we worked together for 10 years until God moved me back to the home church where I became an associate. But one of the things that I constantly looked back at was his noble character. He was a man who was generous, a servant. But he didn't have a problem telling me what his thoughts were, <laughs> which I needed. And as we look at this, this word, noble character, Ruth is called this in chapter 3, chapter three, verse 11. It says, and now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people in my town know that you are a woman of noble character. It's also used of Boaz. It's the idea of strength. It's the idea of valor. 
but it's spiritual strength. You know, when I think of this, this word comes to mind is William Wallace of Braveheart. He goes against the crowd, and he does what he believes is right. And that's what Ruth and Boaz do, as well as Naomi. But she's considered someone of noble character. What can she teach us? What can she teach us about this? There was a Sunday school teacher that I had right after I came to Christ. I came to Christ, started going to a Bible-believing church, that church that actually sent us out to start a church. And this woman and her husband were the senior high Sunday school teacher, Mrs. Hodge. And I remember just her passion for Christ, her passion for Jesus, and her desire to teach the word. And she always had great things to say to us and challenged us. She actually is the one who became kind of a matchmaker for Lisa and I. But I really looked up to her because she had noble character. Building noble character is more than just wishful thinking. When you think about people have these ideas, they have these desires, values are not just ideas or desires. Values are what you hold to dearly and that you're actually doing. You're actually doing. You can say, oh, we value these things. But if you're not doing them, you're not really valuing them. You're basically saying they're desires. Ruth doesn't say much in the book of Ruth herself. It's called Ruth because she's, the, she's one of the primary character, characters in the book, but also she is in the line of Christ. There's a connection there. But she only has nine sentences in the whole book. Nine sentences. Some are very short, and all of those sentences are responses to what Boaz or Naomi asked her except one. She has one request. In chapter 2, she says to Naomi, let me go out into the field to glean, because they needed to live, right? But think about this. Her life is lived, her values are lived out, and you can see it by her actions. We can say all sorts of things. But you and I, our values are seen by how we live. So one of the first things with regard to noble character you see in the book of Ruth, you see in her life is sacrifice for others, sacrificial love, sacrificing for others. And in chapter, chapter 1, verse 18, it says, when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Where was, where was Ruth from? What country? Where was she from? Moab. She left her family, she left her parents' house, and she went with Naomi, who was a widow and who absolutely needed her. But Naomi said, you, you just need to go back home. Just go back home. And she says, no, I'm going to go with you. Your God will be my God. Jesus says in Matthew 10, verse 37, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not find their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Jesus is talking about someone after they come to faith in Christ. He's talking about disciples. When I first came to, to Christ, I remember my family going, wow, he's crazy. And I had to be tempered a little bit because I was doing some things that could have offended them in a way that you want to share the gospel, let that be the offense, not your life or the things that you do. But I stuck to my guns. I said, no, this is what I believe God wants me to do. He wants me to go into ministry. And there were times that I would try to preach at them, and I had these guys working with me and discipling me, and this one guy says, why don't you try this? I was a high school senior, right? He said, why don't you try winning them over? Because my mom kept saying, I don't see it. You say you're born again. I really want to see it. And this one guy, his name was Larry. He was discipling me. He said, why don't you just work on cleaning the house after school? As a teenager. As a teenager. Can you imagine that? Okay, so teenagers, if you want to cause your parents to fall over, do the dishes. Okay. Pick up your room, 
Yes. Don't wait for them to nag. You just do it. Believe it or not, I took his advice, and I did that. I said, this is crazy. Because we got home from school before they got home from work. I cleaned the kitchen. I did the dishes. You know, snacks. Teenagers want to eat a ton of snacks, okay? So cleaned it up, and when they came home, they were like, oh. After a month of that, my mother came and hugged me and said, now I know that you're born again. But it took her 20 years to come to faith in Christ. But think about that. You want to have an impact on people? Put Jesus first, and he will help you love those people. But you can't love them first and then expect God to have an impact on them. Put Christ first. So the question is, how are you sacrificing for those you love? You can see it in Ruth. I watch parents, good parents, sacrifice for their children, but you can't put your children at the center of your life. God has to be first, and then your marriage, and then your children. She was willing to sacrifice sacrificial love, which is agape love, but also be teachable, be teachable. Ruth chapter 3, verses 1 to 6 says, One day Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, my daughter, I must find a home for you. <laughs> the, the idea there is find rest for you. And parents, of course, then were matchmakers, even though Naomi wasn't her parent. Where you will be well provided for. Now, Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight, he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor. We heard all about this last week with Jordan talking all about the, the response where real love is in action. That was great last week. Thank you, Jordan. Put on perfume. Get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let anyone know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go over and uncover his feet and lie down. That was a custom of that day of a woman saying, I want you to take me under your wing. I want you to marry me. It's part of the kinsman redeemer ceremony. Listen to what she says. Verse 5. She doesn't go, oh, that's not going to work. What are you, crazy? I'm, I'm, I'm tired of listening to you. All you do is tell me i got to do this. She doesn't do that. She says, I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. Proverbs 10.8 tells us, The wise in heart accept commands, but a chattering fool comes to ruin. Where are you? Proverbs 9.9, Instruct the wise and they'll be wiser still. Teach the righteous and they will add to their learning. There were times... <laughs> In ministry, when people tried to speak into my life, and I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about. And God was really trying to get my attention. So listen, when people speak to you, wise people, the way of fools, Proverbs 12, 15, the way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. So the question for us is, how hard is it for you to listen when God is sending people to speak to you? Are you teachable? Think about Israel, how many times God sent prophets over and over again, and they wouldn't listen. Even the period of the judges, God raised up a judge, would deliver them, and they would fall right back into it. One of my goals here as lead pastor is to mentor younger men, younger than me, that is, in ministry as pastors and planters. That's why we have the Antioch School, Church Planting, Leadership Development. Because I want to do that. People have done that in my life. They have poured their life into me, and, and I want to do that. But ask yourself, how do I respond to correction? When you know you're wrong, how do you respond? Who's your mentor? Who are the people speaking into your life, and who are you turning around and helping? Maybe it's your children or your grandchildren. Not only was she teachable, she also made right choices based on strong convictions. Ruth chapter 3, verse 7 says, When Boaz had finished eating and drinking, 
He was in good spirits. He went over to lie down at the far end of the grain field. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lie down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner, the wing, that is, like the wing of a garment, of your garment over me, since you are the kinsman or guardian redeemer of our family. She's acting perfectly moral. She's doing what's right. She's reaching out. She's saying, hey, I want you to take care of me. She has strong convictions. She's not trying to seduce him. She's not trying to manipulate him. She's basically going, I was told to do this. Here's the opportunity for you to redeem me. Where are your convictions? What do you stand for? Those deeply held beliefs that guide your actions. A few weeks ago, I watched, started watching a series, docudrama, on the History Channel about Teddy Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt. Excellent series. I had heard little bits and pieces about him with regard to the Rough Riders and you know, his part in the Spanish-American War, but I wanted to know more. And as I discovered, this man, he was president of the United States from 1901 to 1909. It didn't just happen. <laughs> he had an amazing family background. He grew up in a church home that required church attendance and Bible reading, and he came to faith in Christ when he was at age 16. His father taught a Bible study. It was actually Sunday school back then, the late 1800s. Sunday school was not held at church. It was actually an outreach to underprivileged children. And so Teddy Roosevelt taught a Bible study as a teenager to underprivileged children to try to help them come to know Christ. And when he went off to Yale, he continued doing this at Yale University in an Episcopal church, even though he was a Presbyterian. They didn't know he was a Presbyterian. When they found out he was a Presbyterian, they said, you can't do that anymore. <laughs> so he took his, his teaching elsewhere. In 1878, young Roosevelt gave the reading of Scripture, quoting hymns as well, at his father's funeral. And he said, nothing but my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ could have carried me through this, my terrible time of trial, trial and sorrow. He had lost his wife as well and his mother on the same day that developed his character. He said this about his father. My father was the best man I ever knew. He combined strength and courage and greatness and gentleness and great unselfishness. He would not tolerate in us children selfishness or cruelty, idleness, cowardice, or untruthfulness. He was considered by historians one of the five greatest presidents of the U.S. That's why his face is on Mount Rushmore. And here's the part where his convictions came in. He got in so much trouble because the political corrupt politicians and corrupt business people hated him because everywhere he went, he wanted to do the right thing. He said, my convictions are based on my belief in God and the scriptures. Got him in trouble. Actually lost, lost one of his jobs because of it. So where are your convictions? What is so important to you, you say, this is what I believe, and I will stand on what I believe. We need to make right choices not only based on convictions, but also based on love. In chapter 3, verse 10, the Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied, that's Boaz. This kindness, we've looked at that word, this has said, is greater than that which you showed earlier. In other words, by saying, I want to be part of the kinsman redeemer, that part is greater than her taking care of her mother-in-law. You've not run after younger men. Tells us Boaz is not younger. Whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. 
I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am a guardian redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night. And in the morning, if he wants to do this duty as your guardian redeemer, good, let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie her here until the morning. And so she has has said love. She has love that is committed. It's loyal. It's the word for covenant love. In 1 Corinthians 13, it tells us love does not seek its own. It puts others above themselves. Are your choices self-centered or based on self-sacrificing love? Making right choices, we should also avoid the appearance of evil. In chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, so this is referring to Ruth. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized, and he said, No one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, bring me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and placed the bundle on her. Then he went back to town. Then then he went back to town. The scriptures tell us right here, do not let anyone know what is good. In other words, do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. Do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. In other words, there are times when we can say, I'm not going to do that, even though I have the rights, I have the freedom in Christ to do this, but I choose not to do it for the sake of others. As much as possible, we try to prevent gossip. Because you know what gossips want? They want just a little bit of information. They really don't want the truth. They don't want facts. They don't really care about the facts. They just want a little bit of truth, and then they can say something. When I was in Bible college, I had to work my way through school, and this one guy had a car. In Philadelphia, I didn't own a car. I didn't need a car that was public transportation. So he said, hey, I got this job. We're going to rake leaves on this mansion. Outside of Philly, there was these huge mansions that had leaves. They had, like, oak and maple trees. And he said, why don't you come with me? These, these, this Christian couple is really neat. They pay cash, <laughs> and they'll give you breakfast. They'll give you lunch. We just need to be home by dinner. I said, okay. So we go there, and we're raking leaves, making huge piles. And they go, this is back in the 70s now, okay? And we burned the leaves. Giant piles were burning them. And this couple was so neat. When you came in for lunch, they talked to you and asked you about your faith and, and encouraged you. And, and I thought, wow, this is neat. I can't wait. Every Saturday, I'd love to do this. So I get back to school now. I've been working, raking leaves, burning leaf piles. And I said, we're back just in time for dinner. I go in the washroom. I go in the restroom. I wash my hands. There's another guy in there that doesn't really know where I've been. And he goes, you've been smoking in here? He could smell the smoke on me. I said, no. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't chew. And I don't don't go with girls who do. I said, no. He goes, yes, you have. And I'm trying to explain this whole thing to him. But he's jumping to conclusions without having all the facts. I couldn't convince him. I said, whatever. I'm going to dinner. Turn me into the RA. I don't care. You see, Boaz and Ruth were moral people in a very immoral culture because they had strong convictions. Have you caved to the culture? Are you giving in morally? Make right choices. Proverbs 13, 20 says, Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good morals. 
If there are people in your life that are dragging you down and you're the believer and they're not, maybe it's time you find some better friends. If there are people in your life that you're saying, wow, I want to influence them for Christ, but they're dragging you down, (laughs) you're not an influence. Start over. Find some godly Christian friends. Develop those character, and then when God gives you the opportunity to share your faith, are you acting foolishly? How can you turn from evil and show strength by choosing what's good? As we prayed that song, why not allow the Holy Spirit for strength so you can turn from evil and follow Christ? Last thing is, with regard to noble characters, wait on God. Man, that is one of the hardest things, isn't it? It is so hard to be patient. It's like that guy, you know, he says, God, I want patience and I want it now. I've had people say to me, hey, pray for patience for me. I said, I'm not going to pray for patience for you. I'm going to pray you have wisdom (laughs) so you know how to act because James tells us to do that, but I'm not... I'm not going to get involved in that. Chapter 3, verse 16. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, How did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, He gave me these six measures of barley, saying, Don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then Naomi said, Wait, my daughter, wait, my daughter, You'll find out what happens. For the men will not rest until the matter is settled. Now just think of how God puts people in the waiting room. God does it so many times. Abraham and Sarah. Abraham was approximately, what, 75 years old? God says, hey, you're going to have an heir from you. He jumps the gun. Goes with Hagar. Interesting. Gets out of fellowship with God, and then their, their, their children fight. Those two nations fight. Now there's battles between the Arabs and Israelis. Interesting. Because he didn't wait for God's plan. God did eventually, when Abraham's 100 and Sarah's 90, he provides the answer. What helps me wait on God is, is just prayer walks, talking to God, listening. It is so hard sometimes <laughs> I'm like, Lord, I'd really like to see this happen. And as I pray, God's like, wait, wait, trust me, trust me. I love it when my grandkids are around. Little Ayrton, he was with us, and we went swimming together, him and I. And then he's like, I said, you go swimming. He wanted me to go on a slide. I did it a couple times. That was enough. And then I sat in the, the chair, and he, I said, you swim until you're done. And then I knew he would eventually be tired out. And so he goes, all right. And he what caused him to be done swimming, he goes, Pop up, I'm hungry. Okay. I said, where do you want to go? I thought, you know, I'll give you some snacks at home. He goes, no. I, would, would it be okay? I'd like Chick-fil-A. Or He settles on Wendy, Wendy's. I said, okay. Some really healthy food there. So, so as we're driving there, out of nowhere, he says to me, Pop Bob, do you think I should be a lawyer? Okay, he's seven. Do you think I should be a lawyer? And I said, well, God has a plan for you, and why don't you just talk to God, and he'll let you know what he wants you to do. You got a little bit of time yet? And I said, do you know what I do? He goes, of course, you're a pastor. I said, you know, I tried retiring, you know, and you know, maybe someday I'll retire. He goes, you're a pastor. You can't retire. That's what he said. That's what he said. He goes, you're, 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 you're a good pastor. He goes, you need to work on your praying, though. That's what he said. <laughs> and here's why. When the family's together, and if they ask me to pray, I'll you know, thank God for the food and the fellowship and move on. When he prays, he preaches. He gets into it. He connects what's going on in that moment with what's going on. And I'm like, he said, you know, I could help you a little if you want me to. <laughs> I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like, okay. 
But you know what? Waiting on God really takes prayer. We really need to wait on God and listen for what he has, what he has for us. On the other side is there's our due diligence. We have to do our part. Naomi says the men will not rest until the matter is settled. They would go to the gate. Boaz would go there. The elders of the town, those older men, would come together. They would discuss the matter. The other kinsman redeemer, the other guy that's eligible, would come there as the rest of the story goes, and it would be hashed out, and then the decision would be made. It's, re- it's our responsibility, and Paul, you see Paul doing this. He's working as if it all depends on him and praying as if it all depends on God. I remember as a, a new Christian going to prayer meetings at that church that sent me out eventually, and people would say, we need to put feet to our prayers. You know what that means? You're praying about something, and sometimes God wants to use you. You're praying for a lost person, and sometimes God wants to use you to share the gospel with them. We have to put feet to our prayers. You know, when I was single in Bible college, I said, you know, I'd really like to find a wife. I was actually went off into seminary, and I had my list, okay? This is a very important list. She's a believer who loves God. She has the same goals I have with regard to ministry and doctrine have the same desires, children, a family, same convictions. I had that list, and I was praying that list. I was praying, God, show me, lead me. And then someone said to me, they said, you know, it's nice to have that list. That's fine, but are you the right person? I said, wow, I better work on that. But God answered my prayer. She's here, my wife. But if you don't know, if you don't have, if you're a believer and you're not married yet, what are your desires? What do you want? Don't just pray about it. Set goals and say, this is what I'm looking for. This is what I want. As a believer, make sure they know Christ. Put feet to your prayers. Proverbs 28, 19 says, those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies will have their fill of poverty. Have their, <laughs> boy, I'm having trouble speaking today. Will have their fill of poverty. As a church, we have a harvest field. There are people all around us who need Christ. God desires for us to plant seeds. Plant seeds. Plant the seeds of the gospel to get the word out. The grandkids had a pumpkin from last October, and we kept it in the garage, and then we took that pumpkin and cut it open and took the seeds out. Now, when we got to that part, they did not want to put their hands in it. They made me do it. So I put my hands in it, pulled the seeds out. We separated it, put it on brown paper, and I said, hey, when it gets time, we're going to plant these seeds. And so at the right time, we got all these pots, we planted them, and then the pumpkins began to grow. And then we transplanted them in the back hill. Now we're waiting for the harvest. Where has God placed you? Where has God placed you to plant seeds in someone's life? What has he done? How has he given you an opportunity to share the gospel, to preach the gospel? Who has he placed in your life? He says, there are those who chase fantasies will have their fill of poverty. God doesn't want us to be lazy as a church. He wants us to be engaging and reaching people around us. Anybody know who Greg Laurie is? Okay. Yes. I'm reading a book written by him and someone else called The Jesus Revolution. If you get a chance, read it. It's life-changing. He was part of the hippie movement in California in the early 70s into drugs and wild music, etc. He comes to faith in Christ as a 17-year-old. God begins to work in his heart. He says, you know what? I want to go into ministry. So he ends up at Chuck Smith's church, which is Calvary Chapel. 
And, of course, he's young, and they say, okay, he, he's not getting paid. They say, we'll just put you to work. Of course, he did all sorts of things. Then he got involved in helping teach Bible studies with shut-ins and, and in nursing homes. And, and there was a group of young people coming to Christ close to that town. And they sent one of their evangelists over, and he preached the gospel to them, and that group got to about 100, 200, and they just needed somebody to shepherd them. And so different pastors from Chuck Smith's church started going there and preaching every Sunday. And all of a sudden, none of the pastors could make it. And they looked at Greg Laurie, and they said, hey, can you fill in? Now, he's a hippie-looking guy. Long hair, grubby jeans, sandals, some kind of T-shirt. He goes, sure, he's got his old beat up Bible, and he goes to this Episcopal church where they're renting and using, and the stately man who's in charge of the church says, oh, if you want to come in, you can sit in the back. He didn't know he was the preacher that Sunday. And he goes, I'm here to preach. He goes, uh, right. <laughs> Tells him to sit in the back, and he's waiting for the real preacher to show up, and he's like, I told you, I'm it. So he begins to preach. God lays it on his heart. And then next week, he does it again and keeps doing it. Finally, they got so upset, that church that they were using, they got upset, and they said, oh, you can't meet here anymore. <laughs> You're out. So Chuck Smith said, we're going to find you a church building to meet in. They scoured around and got real estate involved. They found an old Baptist church that was empty, and Chuck Smith Church bought that building, paid the down payment, in the first mortgage payment and gave the keys to Greg Laurie and said, here, now you guys, he's 19, now you guys need to take over and come up with the money <laughs> and see what happens from there. And the rest is history. God has used him in an amazing way to reach hundreds of thousands of people. He's still going strong. And his church is called Har Harvest Christian Fellowship. It started way back then. And he said this. He said this in his book with regard to the church. He said he believed in the centrality of the local church, that it was Jesus' designated way to fulfill the Great Commission and bring the love of the kingdom of God to bear on neighborhoods, communities, and nations. So think about that. That's what our responsibility is as a church. We need to be praying and working and allowing God to carry out his plan through us. Carry out his plan through us. Ruth was influenced by Naomi and Boaz. And she didn't just hear what they had to say. She lived it. She did. Remember, she, she turned to God from idols. She believed in the God of Naomi and Boaz. Are you just hearing what God says and not doing it? Matthew 7, 24 says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Built his house on the rock. What hard choices do you need to make, even right now? What is God convicting you of? And you're going, I need to stop that. I need to turn away from that. On that same drive, <laughs> headed to Wendy's with my grandson, Ayrton. I keep thinking he's going to be a preacher. I think it. I really do. We see these bumper stickers on a truck in front of us. And I said, read those bumper stickers. He's just learning how to read. He goes, one of them says, thank you, Jesus. I said, that's right. What's the other one say? Jesus saves. <laughs> I said, okay, what does that mean? He goes, Jesus is going to save you from your sins. That's right. That's the good news, that Jesus came from heaven to earth, perfect God, perfect man, died on a cross, rose again, so that you could have eternal life. When you open your heart to him, he did the work. You can't earn it. I can't earn it. We definitely don't deserve it. Have you made that choice? Have you opened your heart to Christ? Why not do that? Because Jesus is the perfect picture of the kinsman redeemer. He's human, but he's also God. As our 
representative as the one who took on human flesh, that perfect God, perfect man, Jesus died in our place. And John 6.40, it says, Jesus said, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. Maybe God's tugging at your heart. Maybe he's saying to you that you need to trust in Christ alone. Turn away from those false ideas and false gods and trust Christ to save you. Because nothing else will. There's no other name, only in Jesus. Let's have the band come forward. Let's pray together. Father, through the power of your Holy Spirit, you know our hearts. You know the things that we're struggling with, the things that can get in the way of godly character, noble character that you have for us. Lord, we pray that we surrender ourselves to you. We pray that you would afflict the comforted and comfort the afflicted. And we pray, God, that you would truly work in us deeply, that we would not settle, that your Holy Spirit would stir up in us a desire to be that church that you want us to be. If you don't know Christ, don't wait. Don't believe just because you've gone to church your whole life that you're going to heaven. Don't believe just because your parents were believers that you're going to heaven because of that. Are you, and ask yourself this question, am I trusting in Jesus Christ alone for my eternal life? If you can't answer that, why not? Take that step right now. Open your heart to Christ. Trust in him. The Bible says, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Why not just say that? Lord Jesus, come into my life. Save me. Forgive me. Give me eternal life. Jesus said, he that comes to him, he will no wise cast out. During this response time, maybe God's tugging at your heart to have someone pray with you. Just respond. Come forward. Or just to pray and and seek the Lord in that way. God, thank you that you are the one who knows our hearts. We ask and humbly bow before you and say, help us to become the kind of church and the kind of people you want us to be. In your name, Lord Jesus, amen.